So let's suppose we take an object, a ball, and we tie a massless cord to our ball. And we take the massless cord at one end, and we begin spinning our object. So our object, our ball, is undergoing uniform circular motion. Now what that basically means is that the magnitude of velocity, uh, the speed of our object, remains constant. So let's suppose we're spinning our object and we take a snapshot of our object. We get the following picture. So this is our radius of our circular pathway created by our ball. And this radius represents our cord, our massless cord. So we're spinning our massless cord, we take a snapshot and we get the following picture. Now, at this given moment in time, our velocity, the magnitude of velocity, is exactly the same as the magnitude of velocity everywhere else. But, our direction is unique. At this point in time, our velocity vector points exactly tangent to the pathway created by our moving object. So as we're spinning our object, the velocity vector is continually changing direction. And that means it's continually accelerating. So once again, at any given moment in time, the object tends to move along a straight path. So for example, at this point, the object tends to move in the positive direction along the x-axis. As a result, the velocity is always tangent to the pathway circumscribed by our moving object. So recall that according to Newton's first law of motion, an object should remain in its current state of motion unless acted upon by some net force. So at this given moment in time, our object wants to move in this direction along a straight line, but it doesn't. It changes its velocity vector, it changes direction. The motion is changed. And that means some net force must be acting on our object. Some net force must be acting on the ball, accelerating the ball, changing its direction of the velocity vector. What exactly is this force? Well, recall that when we're spinning our ball, we're pulling on the string. So we create tension in the string. And in fact, that tension in the string exerts a force on our ball, pulling it inward. And that's exactly what causes our ball to accelerate and move in a circular pathway. So, once again, However, the object does not move in a straight line, but rather takes a circular pathway. The massless cord exerts a force on the ball that always points inward towards the center of our circular pathway. And this force that pulls on our object through our cord is known as centripetal or simply radial force. Now the magnitude of our radial or centripetal force is given by the following equation which really comes from Newton's second law of motion. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So our centripetal force is equal to the mass of the moving object multiplied by our centripetal acceleration which recall can be represented by v squared divided by r. So we can rewrite this formula using the following equations. So the mass of the ball multiplied by the magnitude of velocity squared divided by r and that gives us the magnitude of our centripetal force and it always points towards the center of our circle. So notice that our force and the velocity vector are always perpendicular to one another. And that simply means that the magnitude of our velocity will not change, but the direction will. Our object will still be accelerating, moving around in a circular pathway. Now, let's for a moment recall Newton's third law of motion. Newton's third law of motion says, for every action force, there is a reaction force. For example, if I push on my wall, if I push on my whiteboard, the whiteboard will push back. So, 
According to Newton's third law of motion, since the cord exerts a force on the ball, that means the ball will react, creating a force, exerting a force on the cord. And this force is known as centrifugal force. Now, this force only exists as long as the centripetal force exists. In other words, if I'm pushing on the whiteboard, the whiteboard is pushing back. If I let go, the whiteboard also stops pushing back. So what happens is, I'm pulling on my cord, so I'm pulling on my object, and the tension in the cord creates a force on the object, and that object reacts by creating a force on our uh, rope. And that's exactly what we feel when we spin our ball. If we spin our ball, we feel a force pulling in our hand. And that force, we feel that force because of this centrifugal force. So, at any given time, when I'm pulling on my string, when I'm accelerating my string in uniform circular motion, I have two net for or I have two forces acting along the y-axis. I have the force that I'm pulling with, the tension in my rope, and I have this force that my ball creates on our rope. Now, what happens when I let go of my rope? Well, as soon as I let go of my rope, I remove the centripetal force, and that means if I remove my action force, I also remove my reaction force. So as soon as I let go, these two forces disappear and my object will move along a straight path because the velocity vector, our motion vector, points in this direction. So once again, these two forces are action-reaction forces and they're exactly opposite of one another. So let's look at the following example. What is the force, what is the centripetal force we need to apply on a massless cord with a length of 0.5 meters to spin a 0.2 kilogram ball three revolutions every six seconds? So we basically want to use the equation that we saw here. So our centripetal force that we need to apply on our cord, on our massless cord, is equal to the mass of our object, the ball, multiplied by our radial or centripetal acceleration. So, let's rewrite this with the following equation. So, mass times v squared divided by r. So, notice that we're given that the ball spins, makes three full revolutions every six seconds. So that means we can use that information to find our velocity. So we simply use this information to find the frequency and then we use the frequency to find the velocity of the object. So recall that velocity is equal to 2 times pi times r, the circumference, multiplied by our frequency. So frequency in this case is simply 3 divided by 6, so 0 0.5. So mass times 2 times pi times r times frequency squared divided by r. Notice that we can take out the r squared and we get r squared divided by r. So the r on the bottom cancels and we're left with the following formula. So we know what mass is, it's 0 0.2 kilograms. We know what f is, we just said it's 0 0.5 revolutions per second. And we know what r is, it's 0 0.5 meters. So we plug in our values and we see that we need to apply approximately a force of one newton on our rope, on our massless rope, for our object to spin in the following pathway as described in the example.